welcome everyone to the Confucius Institute U.S. Center. 欢迎大家来到孔子学院美国中心。Uh, my name is Melissa Christensen, and I joined the CIUS Center when I moved here from Shanghai last year. My passion is building bridges of understanding across cultural differences. I spent my formative years in Belgium, and my father grew up in South Africa. So my worlds collide in a peculiar way <laughs> this evening. We are honored to host this important dialogue on the value of U.S., China, and Africa partnerships and resource support for global education, language development, people-to-people -people exchange programs, and higher education partnerships to help advance entrepreneurship, economic development, and employment empowerment in Africa. Partnerships like the U.S. China Strong Foundation and the Young African Leaders Initiative and the Confucius Institutes are examples of this partnership ethos. The Confucius Institute is an educational not-for-profit network that advances global education, Chinese language development, cultural awareness, people-to-people -people exchanges, and higher education partnerships. There are more than 500 Confucius Institutes in approximately 125 nations throughout the world, each associated with a university, college, or school system. The CIUS Center exists to support the 110 Confucius Institutes across the United States through professional development, strategic communications, and academic research support services. The Confucius Institute Network in Africa includes 49 vibrant Confucius Institutes and 27 Confucius classrooms in 38 countries in Africa. In addition to the standard programs, Confucius Institutes in Africa partner with industry companies to provide Chinese language development for employees and host job fairs for career development. Tonight's discussion has a strong focus on the added value benefits of entrepreneurship, development of small and medium enterprises, language development, global education, and employee empowerment in Africa. We are delighted that you're here. And also to share a recording of this dialogue with our national audience in the Confucius Institute Network across the United States. We're honored to have four internationally renowned thought leaders on our panel tonight whose expertise in our program topic is extensive. And tomorrow being International Women's Day, I'm thrilled to have three female thought leaders on our panel tonight. Following our discussion, we will open the program to audience Q&A. So please use the question cards in your program and hand them to my colleague, is Sarah Parshall here? or hand them to Cheyenne Boyce right here, my colleague, in the next 20 minutes or so. It's my honor to introduce each of our distinguished panelists. Her Excellency, Dr. Chihomboi Kwao, is the African Union Ambassador to the United States. She's a distinguished medical doctor, an educator, and diplomat, who is committed to building constructive relationships between Africa and the United States as well as mobilizing the African diaspora in the United States. Dr. Chihombohi Kwao received the Woman of Excellence Award at the 25th African Union Summit in 2015. Ambassador Robin Rene Sanders is the CEO of Feeds Advocacy Initiative and owner of Feeds LLC. She works in economic development, African diaspora, information and communication technology, and business strategies for Africa. She served as U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria, Republic of Congo, and ECOWAS. Her excellent recent book is entitled The Rise of Africa's Small and Medium Enterprises. We are grateful that Ambassador Sanders bought a few copies available for sale and autograph after the panel discussion. Ms. Irene Yuanson is the engagement manager at McKinsey & Company, who co-leads work on Chinese economic engagement in Africa. She's a thinker and practitioner in this sector, as well as a triple Harvard graduate. Her excellent book is entitled, The Next Factory of the World, How Chinese Investment is Shaping Africa. And it was named by Financial Times as one of the best business books of 2017. 
It's also available for purchase and autograph after our panel discussion. Finally, we have the great privilege to have Ambassador Ruben Brigitte to moderate our panel. Ambassador Brigitte is the Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University, which is home to a thriving Confucius Institute since 2013 in partnership with Nanjing University. The book Ambassador Brigitte is writing on healing America makes the national security case for strengthening national unity. His extensive diplomatic career includes an appointment as representative of the U.S. to the African Union and permanent representative of the U.S. to the U.N. Economic Commission for Africa. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank Melissa, thank you very much for the kind introdu introduction and uh, our deep gratitude to the Confucius Institute U.S. Center for hosting this very important topic tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is my honor to be your moderator this evening and particularly to uh, moderate such a distinguished panel of experts. So what I'd like to do is begin just by asking uh, each of our panelists uh, a question or two uh, to get the conversation started. Uh, and as we're doing so, please, as Melissa mentioned, uh, feel free to write down a question or questions on your card uh, so that we can get to questions from the audience as soon as possible. So uh, Ambassador Chiambori Kwao, my sister, uh, let me begin with you, if I may. So certainly in this country, uh, these days when people talk about Africa and U.S. engagement in Africa, the next uh, word in the sentence almost always has to do with China. And from the African perspective, I'm wondering how uh, you see the nature of engaging a series of partners uh, outside of Africa. Uh, not simply the United States and China. And from your perspective as well, do you see uh, Chinese-US competition or cooperation? And what would you like to see in terms of uh, uh, engagement with these two very important partners? I'd like to thank Ambassador Bridget He and the Confucius Institute for uh, having us here and uh, to discuss such an important uh, topic. Uh, I think as an African, sometimes I, I often find myself uh, when you look at Africa and the fact that Africa is, uh, I like to think that we are the, the mother of all countries. And we're also the richest continent on earth. And then when you look at our relationship with the United States and our relationship with China, you can't think of any relationships in the world that could be more important. Africa and any other country besides the United States and, uh, and China. Looking at the uh, current involvement of uh, China in, in Africa and looking at our history as Africa going back to the uh, colonial masters and uh, later on the United States uh, also coming to Africa and then uh, China is a, is a late comer. One then wonders why is it that there seem to be a sh to have been a shift of the Africans moving more towards China, uh, not to the same extent that the other ones would be drifting more towards strengthening the relationships with the United States. You can't help but realize that when you are hungry and you need food and you need food now, you are not at liberty to choose uh, who you engage with. Our reality was, like some ministers of uh, finance might say, when we need money as Africans, the Chinese will say how much with the checkbook in hand. And when we go to the West, we jump through hoops. So over the years, I think China had a strategy on how to uh, get into Africa. And their strategy was to get in get as much as you can, and uh, at the same time, bring in as many Chinese as possible. We have coupled with uh, the realities that when China came to Africa, yes, they assisted us when we were in financial difficulties as countries, but at the same time, 
any development projects that they were given, they brought in Chinese workers as well. I think that was okay for a while, but we're at a point where it's no longer okay. There's need for skills transfer, and I think the African uh, leaders are now also collectively re-strategizing. But what's interesting is China has also realized that they've been playing this game with one strategy, but it's not time for time out. It's time to go to the, re to the sidelines and re-strategize. And I think they're doing precisely that. We had issues with work workmanship from the Chinese companies. Um, quite often, some of the roads that they built didn't last long. They didn't hold up. The buildings didn't hold as well. But I'm glad to say all that is changing. Their workmanship is improving. And also, they're beginning to realize the importance of skills transfer. So increasingly, we are seeing more and more companies beginning to hire local, local labor. So they are shifting their strategy. The question then becomes, where does this leave the United States? There's also a need for a shift in strategy when it comes to how the United States engages Africa. I think the also, they also need to go to the sidelines and uh, re-strategize, and there needs to be a shift in how the United States engages Africa. At the end of the day, it's business. Whoever gives us the best deal is who is going to end up eventually benefiting and engaging with Africa even more. That's not something that, on a personal level, um, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope we don't find ourselves with the United States being uh, sidelined because they are not changing their strategy uh, to match the changing African. So I'll leave it for now at that. But to say, if wishes were horses, Africa would like to see itself with having the best relationships with the United States as well as with China. Thank you, Your Excellency. <clears throat> Ambassador Saunders, you have a deep experience uh, representing the United States across Africa. Uh, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson left yesterday uh, for a seven-day trip to five African countries. And uh, much of the press coverage thus far, before he even left, uh, was that one of the major uh, purposes of this trip was to counter growing Chinese influence in Africa. And yet, the premise of our talk today is that there are areas uh, where the United States and Africa, I'm sorry, where the United States and China can cooperate uh, in Africa for the purpose of African development uh, and also for uh, the advancement of, the, of the, the interests of all countries involved. And I'm wondering if, from your perspective, if you could articulate um, uh, places where you see uh, there are options for cooperation uh, between China and the United States as it relates to um, uh, African economic uh, development, uh, and also places where you might see tension, in particular on uh, questions of governance uh, and how uh, and, and democratic versus other models of, uh, of, of uh, political governance. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I thank uh, my fellow panelists, as well as the moderator, and certainly for the Institute for hosting us. Um, what I'd like to say on China, Africa, and the U.S. is that the China model in Africa, I have watched on the ground for years, and I've seen this inc incredible transformation take place on how China engages on the continent. Uh, I think that there's been a huge shift. Uh, China has been very strategic and very tactical in its efforts to focus on development, to focus on infrastructure, to focus on entrepreneurship. Um, and I think they've done a, a lot better job uh, than the United States has done. And I'm wondering and I'm concerned and I do take note of what uh, the ambassador said that we are stepping back a little bit from Africa, where we sh we're in a t at a point of time where we shouldn't be stepping back from Africa. So to the points that 
uh, were directed at me in terms of what sectors, what areas of development and cooperation and areas of tension. One of the things that, uh, that was very evident uh, in the research that I just recently did was the, the types of focus that China is doing in the region. They are looking at the trade, business, investment, development, entrepreneurship, education. I mean, it's multifaceted. Uh, we have stepped back from that as the U.S., and it's, it's to our detriment. When you look at the, the two biggest countries that will have the two biggest populations in the world, uh, the continent of Africa and certainly China, uh, that is a natural connection that we don't have. So therefore the U.S. has to do a little bit more. It has to engage in business, it has to engage in trade. When you think about the trade piece in particular of areas of cooperation, uh, both China and Africa have the two largest populations and so therefore where is your market going to be? Your market is either going to be in China if you're a business person or an entrepreneur, or it's going to be in Africa if you're a business and entrepreneur. Chi uh, Africa will have the largest population and will outstrip China's population by 2035 and have the largest working population in the world. So I do think the areas of cooperation for the U.S. and China has to be in the areas of exchanges, uh, in the areas of economic development. And I, when I talk about economic development, I'm looking at the social sectors that need the biggest help, and that's in education. And education for me is education with a big E. If you look at what came out of the World Economic Forum um, last month, there were three main pillars for going forward. They were education, they were adaptation, and, they were, and it was innovation. And I think that we as two partners, China and the U.S., can work together in Africa on those three pillars. Of note, as in a good example in that area, is there's not enough vocational training that's being done on the continent. And I do think that uh, if we look at the history of the U.S. and we look at what China is doing, particularly in its rural development programs, vocational training is becoming a big part of that. So why don't we work together in terms of vocational training? on the continent because I don't personally think, given the size of Africa's population, that you're going to be able to have enough formal or traditional jobs to be able to absorb that population. So vocational training and entrepreneurship has got to be part of that. What I really like to see, and I really commend China for, are two things, a number of things, but in particular, I'm a, I'm a big advocate for what China is doing in some regards on the continent. And that advocacy focuses on the, the Belt and Road Initiative, that $8 trillion infrastructure part of the Belt and Road Initiative. That's very strategic, that's very forward thinking, and Africa needs a, a big piece of that. Then you have the finance part, and finance is a big aspect of that. China has stepped up on financing, whether it's the Chinese export uh, import bank. Uh, on our side, we pretty much pulled the reins back in on the U.S. <coughs> export import bank for the time being. You've got the China Development Bank, and you've got a number of, of Chinese summits that are focused just on Africa entrepreneurship. And then you have the annual China-Africa Summit. We are not engaged in the same way on the continent, and we need to be. So I think that uh, the special economic zones is a tool that needs to be used a bit more. Uh, China right now has about six that is developing on the continent. If you don't know what those are, it's, it's a zone where you bring large businesses and you bring entrepreneurs together so that they can not only trust and learn from each other, but you are able to really train and provide that educational and that business experience to the next generation of entrepreneurs. So I do think that model of special economic zones where you bring manufacturing, small manufacturing included, you bring your entrepreneurs in, you bring your big businesses from the U.S. and from China together in one cooperative working space where they're learning from each other and they're learning to respect each other. On the educational piece, uh, one of the things that I did as a diplomat is I ran the U.S. State Department's Africa Division for Public Diplomacy that included educational exchanges. I was director for that program for three years. And that brought in this idea of mutual understanding and mutual respect. And I think the more we have those kinds of exchanges, and sometimes they can be dual, they can be representatives from the U.S., representatives from China working together on one exchange program.
so that you build bridges not only with our African partners, but with our Chinese uh, counterparts and with the American counterparts on one project together. So those are some of the examples that I see on the ground now that I would like to see actually expand uh, and be more developed. And lastly, I cannot say enough about women. 50.2% uh, of the population on the continent is now represented by women and girls. So if you leave out women and girls on any side, whether it's the Chinese side or whether it's the American side or whether it's the African side, then you are not going to have economic development on the continent. Uh, there's a financing gap of $285 billion, I didn't say million, I said billion dollars for female entrepreneurs worldwide. And a good chunk of that is on the African continent. So the areas of cooperation have got to be financing, particularly for entrepreneurial, vocational training, those special economic zones that I talk about, and infrastructure development. Those are, those are no, uh, win-wins for everybody if we are able to do that partnership and that cooperation together. I've spoken long enough, so I'll deal with tension later. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, before I go to Ms. Sun, may I ask our staff to begin collecting uh, questions from the audience so that we can begin to move into uh, uh, Q&A thereafter. <clears throat> so, Ms. Sun, uh, you are clearly uh, one of the experts in the uh, story of Africa's economic transformation over the coming the next decades. I'm one who happens to believe that Africa's, uh, the next chapter of Africa's history will be defined by private sector-led economic growth. And the question is, how is that going to happen in, in, in a partnership with whom? Uh, with regard to Chinese engagement, the general narrative uh, that is out there, as Ambassador uh, Jim Bori uh, noted, is that, yes, Chinese are heavily engaged on the continent. But as a general proposition, uh, they are engaged either in extractive uh, various forms of uh, activity, or to the extent that there is light manufacturing, it's mainly done as a means of, um, of taking advantage of things like uh, uh, AGOA uh, and producing textiles uh, in Africa that can then be imported to the United States, but they're Chinese-owned factories. And I'm wondering if, uh, and then obviously the issue of labor, uh, the importance of Chinese labor. And I'm wondering from your perspective, two things. One, is that narrative basically correct or not? And are the Chinese involved? No. No, which I, which I assume was going to be your answer. And there you're going to educate us about um, the extent to which Chinese are actually involved in product beneficiation on the continent. And secondarily, um, given the title of your book, uh, The Next Factor of the World, uh, to what extent do you think uh, American firms can do more uh, to engage in um, economic activity that, again, uh, helps to uh, beneficiate uh, Africa's natural resources in Africa and help develop wealth actually inside the continent. Um, a lot there. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, the, I want us to all take a step back and ask ourselves, which China in which Africa? China is an enormous country, and there's many parts to it, and I think we need to recognize that. So often, the China-Africa topic gets tracked into this discussion about geopolitics, about what the Chinese government's plans are, um, about nation-to-nation, -nation, governmental, um, international relations. But there's a whole other dimension to it. 90% of the Chinese firms in Africa are private sector firms, not state-owned enterprises. 90%. Right? There is a booming Chinese private sector engagement with Africa. And when you think about it in terms of African development, it's enormously important. Um, I co-lead McKinsey's work on the role of China in Africa. And when you look at the facts on this, you see that China's the fastest growing foreign investor in Africa. It already, in terms of foreign direct investment stock, is number four in the world, even though the Brits and the French and the Americans have had half a century to build up that stock, and China's been building it up in the last decade, primarily. It's already number four. It will be, it will have the largest investment stock within the next decade, easily. When you look at infrastructure financing, um, to Ambassador Sanders' point, China is the largest infrastructure financier by far, much larger than the World Bank. It is seven times 
the size of the next largest bilateral financier. Trade, three times bigger than the next largest trade partner, number one by far. And so it is this private sector engagement that matters most, and it's the ones that matter the most for African people. And to the points that um, Ambassador Jim Burikal is pointing out, you know, when you look at some of the largest concerns and societal um, topics in Africa today, such as employment, um, we, we let, at McKinsey did large scale work where our team went out and visited more than a thousand Chinese firms already operating in Africa. And turns out they collectively employ more than 300,000 people. 90% of the employees are Africans. Right? And when you take a step back and think about it, right? I'm a, I work in private sector, almost always has. They're actually, when you think about investing in a place, it makes no business sense to be importing all your workers. You cannot make a firm run that way. You can't make money that way. And so when you think about it from that perspective, of course, most of the employees of these Chinese firms in Africa are, local Africans from whatever country they happen to be operating in. So I want us to pay attention to that narrative uh, in that whole side of the story because frankly it is, in my opinion, more important than what the government is doing. Um, and that's what my book is about. It's about um, the on-the-ground view of, uh, of more than 50 Chinese factories already operating in Africa. Who are these entrepreneurs? Why did they come to Africa? What is their business model? Um, and it turns out that they're largely today substituting for imports. So anybody that has been to, you know, Nakumar supermarket in Nairobi knows that the prices there aren't that much lower than in the US. In some cases, the prices of manufactured goods are higher than in the US, just basic consumer manufactured goods. And so these factories are taking advantage of that market need. And because these entrepreneurs grew up in factory China, from the ground up, from the factory floor, they really know what they're doing and they know how to run a factory and they see the margins in Africa. And that is is how it is that they can make a business in Africa. Um, and this is important for Africa at the micro level, at the worker level, but it's important for Africa at the societal level because what Africa needs to do in the next generation is to industrialize. If you look at the history of the world, all countries other than essentially Qatar, which lucked into enormous resource well, well beyond even the likes of an Angola uh, or a Russia, all countries that have ever made it to middle income status and stayed there have done so by industrializing. And that needs to happen on the back of manufacturing sector growth. And when you look at the history of the world again, manufacturing sector growth comes from foreign investment in manufacturing, sparking an industrial transformation. This is what has just happened in China. And in China, it lifted 700 million people out of poverty, the most that has ever been lifted out of poverty in the history of the world. That is the potential for Africa if Africa becomes the next factory of the world. I'll stop there. Uh, so we have, um, I have a series of questions and I'm gonna simply ask them in order uh, without um, uh, favor or, or pre-screening, um, but I have to ask two other questions first. I'm fascinated by everything you just said. Uh, first to you, Ms. Sun. Um, you've made a very compelling case for why private sector um, uh, Chinese entrepreneurs who know how to run factories are in Africa. One, they know how to do it. Two, they see the margins. See, they see the opportunity and they execute. Uh, you are a Harvard Business School graduate. Yes? Yep. Uh, you work for McKinsey, so you know business. And um, why is it that American firms are not doing the same thing? That gets into a, essentially a historical accident. Um, and you have to know a little bit about the history of the manufacturing industry over the last 
you know, essentially century. And the way that manufacturing works is through, and it's best typified in the economics literature through this theory called the flying geese theory, which is that manufacturing firms are like a flock of geese. They, it's a flock. It's not like, you know, what are lone animals? Like leopards are lone animals. They're not leopards, they're geese. They flock together. And uh, the UK was the first country to ever industrialize, so they built up a, a class of manufacturing firms. And then over time, those firms invested in the US. And the US built up its flock of manufacturing firms. In the 20th century, Japan was sort of the first notable example of actually taking manufacturing investment from the US and Europe, frankly, in building up a domestic flock of firms that became globally competitive, they in turn invested in the Asian tigers. So South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. And then they went to China. And that's what happened in China in the 80s and 90s. Um, and so the point of why I talk about all this is that the reason why there isn't the potential for tons and tons of U.S. manufacturing investment in Africa is because that flock of geese hasn't just left America. It left America a long time ago. <laughs> and the U.S. is still deeply competitive in many manufacturing sectors. So technologically advanced manufacturing, um, uh, sophisticated value chains, parts suppliers. So U.S. manufacturing is absolutely viable in many subsectors of manufacturing. But when you talk about entry-level manufacturing for a society, so things like sewing clothing together, textile, weaving cloth together, even basic materials, so ceramic tiles, um, steel rods, smelting, these things, entry-level manufacturing, that stuff, that spark will come from China. And because that's where the industry is. And it's not just that they're attracted to Africa, they're being pushed out of China. So manufacturing labor costs have gone up more than 10% per year for the last decade in China. Power costs have gone up substantially as well. And so these firms are seeing the writing on the wall in China. They're seeing their margins narrow. They know they need to go somewhere. And by the way, they are going to other places. Um, one, of the, one of the entrepreneurs that I, that I interview in this book uh, in Nigeria, I'm like, oh, how did you end up in Nigeria? And he's like, well, you know, I looked at Vietnam. I'm like, okay. Looked at Iran, I'm like, Oh, okay. I looked at Uzbekistan. Okay. And I looked at Nigeria. Th that, that was the set of countries he looked at. And he decided to invest in multiple of those places, actually. And so they're going outside. But to the structural factors that Ambassador Sanders is saying, in 2050, Africa will have 2 billion people essentially double what it is today. Southeast Asia will have 7 or 800 million people. Right? And so the long-term structural forces are in Africa's favor, but that doesn't mean it's obvious, and it doesn't mean that this flock of manufacturing firms won't go somewhere else first before they go to Africa, and that, to me, would be a huge missed opportunity for Africa. Thank you. My final question uh, for the ambassadors. So we have talked about uh, a, a number of ways and areas uh, in which uh, Africa can benefit from both Chinese and American engagement, principally uh, foreign investment. Uh, one can imagine others, for example, in developing healthcare systems um, or education, as Ambassador Saunders said. But there is one area in which there is clearly diametrically opposed view, and that is on governance and democracy in particular. Um, the Chinese basically uh, offer a series of African governments an option of a model, indeed, for economic prosperity without political liberty. Uh, and the United States has traditionally uh, been uh, on the side of advancing democracy, however imperfectly it may have done that. And, uh, and thus, there is a serious debate happening on the continent right now uh, about the future of uh, political systems and political governance, one that almost certainly will be highlighted during Secretary Tillerson's trip. So from your respective perspectives, 
Uh, how do you see the future of uh, African political governance in the next 20 years, and what roles do you see that China and the United States might play uh, in that space? Uh, Ambassador Timbori, you first. I think the issue of governance um, in Africa is, uh, is a serious problem. It gets to the issues of peace and security, and without peace and security uh, in any country, there is no economic development. Uh, it's such a, uh, an important issue for the African Union that even our budget, 60% of it, is going towards uh, peace and security. We can divide the uh, uh, issues on the continent, for example, uh, democracy and uh, good governance, uh, the central region is, is, is a serious problem there. Um, and then, of course, issues of terrorism, which also get in the way of uh, democracy and good govern governance. We're looking at uh, the northern, northern uh, northwestern regions, uh, and then most of the north, as well as some parts of uh, East Africa. So. Looking at uh, democracy and good governance in, in Africa, it's a multifactorial uh, problem. But I have to say, terrorism is really making it mission impossible in terms of uh, building um, peaceful nations and bringing the peace and security that is needed in order for development to, to take place. Um, outside even the Chinese and, and, and the U.S. The U.S. comes in on the side of realizing that the issues of peace and security, um, particularly when it comes to uh, terrorism, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a world problem that uh, everybody's going to have to participate, particularly when it comes to Africa. Especially when you also try to understand uh, how the fight against uh, terrorism and vis-a-vis -vis peace and security, which goes on down to also democracy and good governance. The root cause of it, um, the situation in Libya, for example, um, some of you may not realize it, but um, ISIS, while we are winning the war against ISIS in the Middle East, they're all coming to Africa through, through Libya. Uh, Libya currently, the government is controlling maybe half of Libya. There are many parts of Libya right now that are no-go areas. Uh, terrorist camps have taken those regions and are, are self-governing in those areas. So now that leaves us with uh, about 3,000 kilometers of unprotected Mediterranean and we also have 1,000 more kilometers of the Sahara. So we have a tunnel through Libya uh, through which these terrorists are leaving Europe, I mean, Europe and the Middle East and just flooding Africa. And we are not capable of uh, really dealing with terrorism to the extent that we can. Along with uh, uh, the, the terrorists comes in the youth unemployment. They're getting attracted to terrorism. So it, 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 it models the, the, the terrain in terms of saying chicken and egg. And along the way, we have our own pre-existing uh, conditions of some uh, leaders, not all. So even in countries that probably could do better, we have challenges that are making the ability to address issues of uh, good governance and peace and security, uh, mission impossible. So I can't pin it all on one issue, but that there are multiple factors that are leading to the current conditions in Africa in terms of uh, peace and security and democracy and good governance. Now, the US has always played um, a role in trying to moderate when it comes to uh, issues of good governance. Now, there are some countries that I think uh, the leaders could do better uh, in spite 
of other factors that come into play. And the African Union on our end are uh, working with our partners, are doing what we can, for example, DRC. We are heading towards elections, uh, hopefully on the 23rd, that the date will not change. Uh, we have other countries that are just deadlocked. Uh, you look at Burundi. Um, that's just, you gotta remember that also membership in the African Union is, uh, is voluntary. And uh, the African Union can only push so much. We don't have, as a body, uh, we're not a sovereign entity. These governments are sovereign governments. And they can elect to uh, not become members of the African Union. So we have limited powers in terms of what we can do uh, in trying to promote uh, democracy and good governance in Africa. But that is not stopping us from pushing. The United States has been a very important ally uh, along those lines. China, not, uh, not much. Um, so it's, it's work in progress. But I also say the situation in Africa is a very, it's a very depressing one in the sense that to a great extent, we would like to think and hope that we can say we're in control of our own destiny. But it's far, that is far from the truth. We're very much controlled in everything that we do. Um, I often say, we talk about corruption in Africa, for example, uh, but if all the corruption in Africa was to, to cease miraculously, there would still be corruption in Africa. Why? Because you have special interest multinationals that are heavily involved in even the issues of democracy and good governance. You find some countries that speak from two corners of their mouths, um, so I often speak of, uh, we talk about the monkeys and the squirrels in the room. We talk about superficial issues when it comes to uh, democracy, good governance, peace and security in Africa. And quite often we don't talk about the 10,000 pound gorilla in the room, which are the outsiders who are playing football in Africa. That is what is going to make Africa a challenge as we try to deal with issues of democracy and good government. Even some that outwardly are supposed to be working with us, but in the night, the activities are counterproductive to what we are trying to accomplish as Africans. When you look at um, a country like DRC, even if we have elections in December, I feel sorry for the next president who's gonna come in. It's such a wealthy country that there are so many multinationals from outside that are players within the country of DRC. They have no interest in seeing peace and security in the region. For as long as there's instability, they continue to get away with their dirty work. So Africa is a challenge. We are aware of some of those challenges. The real question is, how do we overcome them? It is just a sad story, honestly. I, I just have to be very honest with you. Some of you will probably know more about the games that are being played in Africa to keep us from attaining the utopia that our Africa is because of the pre-existing sometimes relationships that have been in Africa for so long. So yes, we have partners, but sometimes it's just very difficult to decipher who is a friend and who is a foe. The world needs to be fair to Africa. The world needs to stop exploiting Africa to the extent that the world is exploiting Africa. I liken it to uh, setting my house on fire and then you take off running and asking me why my house is on fire. The world needs to be fair to Africa.
Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go straight to uh, some of our questions. Uh, the first question uh, is from uh, Kay Tang from uh, Johns Hopkins. And the question is, in terms of capacity building in Africa, which sector do you think are the most urgent uh, to focus on? Manufacturing, agriculture, infrastructure, uh, uh, which is most important to improve people's welfare? Uh, Ambassador Sanders, can I take that? Thank you. Uh, that's definitely in my wheelhouse as a question. Uh, the research that I did, I actually put together what I call the top eight list in the book. It's called the, my tell list. And I really looked at areas for um, small and medium sized enterprises in Africa where they could be not only value added, but also uh, move forward. Because a lot of the small businesses that I've seen and that I work with, they are small businesses, but they want to also aid development. Uh, so I call them businesses aiding development, actually, in the book. And the sectors that, I won't give you all eight, but I'll just give you a general sense of where the value added can be. Manufacturing, for sure, and that's small manufacturing. Uh, food processing, I divided agriculture over three of the other sectors. I didn't make agriculture a standalone sector because when you look at agriculture along the value chains, there, it's all along the value chain. So under uh, services, under manufacturing, food processing, under services, one of my favorite apps is one called iCow, which is a, a Kenyan developed app, which is, functions like a mercantile uh, exchange for small farmers that have cows. I think you have um, uh, areas like climate change, which is a big one that uh, I think small businesses in Africa can really add value to because there's so many uh, challenges in climate change on the continent where uh, big businesses aren't focused, where I think small entrepreneurs can come in and help with green solutions, uh, help with uh, 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 water drought issues, and there are a number of small Africa businesses that are focused strictly in those areas. Uh, I also included tourism. The UN World Tourism um, agency has said that one in four jobs on the continent are going to come from tourism. And so tourism would be another area that, that I would add that's on my top uh, eight list. Then I have a catch-all, which is number eight, which I call the aha moment uh, category. And that is because you have the ability, particularly if you go back to the three pillars I mentioned at the beginning that the World Economic Forum is focused on. You have education, innovation, and adaptation. And so when you think of what's the aha moment, when you think of, of um, companies like Uber, that's not a rocket science idea. It filled a need, it filled a, a, an enterprising gap. And so you see a lot of those uh, happening on the continent where they're filling a need. Uh, a great example uh, that I like to talk about is uh, the Maxco in, in uh, Lagos. It's a very Uber-like app but it deals with motorcycles. Because even if you're in an Uber in Lagos traffic, you're still stuck in Lagos traffic. You're not moving anywhere. So the motorcycles give you a little cap, you know, a little mask, and you drive around, and uh, it, it fills a need. So that aha moment, what, what, what is the service need in your area, what I tell the entrepreneurs that I work with? You know, what is that gap that you might be able to fill? What is that aha moment that you might be able to fill? And one of the other things on business, we talked about the industrial base. Uh, both in China and in the U.S. But I do want you to be cautious on that because when you think about the fact that in 1953, our Small Business Administration was created in the United States, you think about how long that is between when we started as an industrialized country and then when we had our SBA. Uh, there are only four African countries with ministries of small businesses. They're all assumed under the trade ministry, under the commerce ministry. So one of the things I'm advocating in here is that if your growth, economic growth, is primarily going to come from SMEs, and I believe it will, just like it, it's doing in China, just like it has done here in the U.S., because there are only 987 large companies with 100 employees or more in the United States, but there are 28 small businesses, 28 million small businesses in the United States. So your growth is going to come from there, and the same thing I think is going to happen on the African continent. So if you are not focused on a 
a entity like a ministry of small businesses or whatever you want to call it, you're not going to be able to marshal your resources, your policy, your trade, uh, your partnerships in a, in a strategic manner. It took us long enough to figure that out uh, here in the United States, and I'm hoping to see more African countries take a look at that and really start having their own standalone uh, small business administration because the bulk of employment even though you will have traditional employment, even though you will have large em uh, em uh, um, employers, I think for the size of the potential population on the African continent, you're going to have to do much, much more to encourage and support entrepreneurs and the diaspora entrepreneurs to fill some of those uh, sector uh, issues that I talked about, small business, construction, infrastructure, agriculture broken down in the service sectors, climate change, tourism, and whatever that aha idea you come up with where there's a service need in your community, in your city, in your country that is not being filled, fulfilled today. Thank you, Ambassador. So we have time for one last question. Um, and the question comes from, I believe, Prosper. Uh, and the question is, how will the IMF and the World Bank affect the relationship between China and Africa? And Ms. Sun, I wonder if you might be willing to address that, particularly given that you talked about how obviously much larger FDI is in Africa. So what role for the FEs as it were in the future of Africa? And I'll actually broaden that question a little bit to what China's um, impact on the global development apparatus is sort of writ large. Um, and I think this is one of the most fascinating developments of our time, actually, which is that the, the global development governance system, as epitomized by the World Bank and the IMF, um, came out of Bretton Woods. Uh, it came out of World War II, and it was essentially a Western-led creation. And of course, lots of countries in the world are party to this. China is, is a, a shareholder in the World Bank Group. Um, but you know, in terms of actually the governance of it and who really makes the decisions, it's been Europe and the US. And over the last few years, China has made quite a few moves to try to have more of a say at that table. And so what you have seen in the last couple of years is the creation of two, not one, but two $100 billion development banks um, with heavy Chinese leadership. Uh, one of them is called the New Development Bank. It was formerly known as the BRICS Bank. Um, and so the five BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, um, were the founding shareholders. It changed its name to the New Development Bank in order to open it up actually to other countries as well um, to be shareholders and participants. And the other one is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, which is one of the key uh, institutions building the Belt and Road Initiative, which is sort of a dream of a interconnected Eurasia uh, global trade superhighway. And so what you see really is that, you know, China is trying to have more of a leadership role. And this is quite a shift. Right for most of my life as a Chinese person, you know, China was like, oh, we're we're we need to develop ourselves. We're a developing country. We have a lot of things to work on, and you know, it did not take nearly as activist of a role on the global stage, and we see that shifting. And I think that is an enormous opportunity for other countries because. China is unique, it has unique experiences, um, it has something to offer. Of course, it needs to be careful as well because none of this stuff is easy and the trade-offs involved are extremely challenging. But to have a, a country actually in a leadership position that has so recently developed itself to have that practical experience of what it means to build your own country and to have people alive that were par core parts of doing that, I think that is an enormous resource and has enormous force, a potential as a force for good in the world. Thank you very much. If you can do it in 10 seconds. But one of the things on the NDB that is just so fabulous is that it loans in local currency.
and the IFIs have just now started doing that just to combat with NDB, and I think loaning and local currency is just the way to go. So we've come to the appointed hour, uh, ending just uh, right at 7 o'clock. You can see by the stack of questions I have that we could go easily for number three hours uh, and not be bored, but I hope you will uh, agree with me that this has been an incredibly rich conversation. Uh, so please join me in thanking our panelists, and thank you all very much for coming. This evening.